So what we want to do is we want to build a blanket, right? Uh, and some pillows. The pillows will be pretty easy. Um, I'll show you kind of a, um, a cool new um, feature that we can use if we want to. Um, but uh, the big thing is the blanket here, right? Because uh, that's going to allow us to do our first little bit of spline modeling, right? Um, we're going to do a loft. Now, what is a spline? Well, simply put, a spline is a curve, right? Spline is just a curve. So what we're going to do is we're going to create a couple of curves here that are going to allow us to actually um, uh, loft between these, right? Um, that's kind of like a bridge tool. We haven't really gone over the bridge tool yet. But we're going to see it uh, on many occasions. That's actually one of the more powerful tools. Uh, there's probably four tools that you can do most modeling with. It's extrude, bridge, multi-cut, and bevel, right? That, that can really take care of a lot for you, right? There's other tools that are great and useful, but you can do quite a bit just with those four tools. Uh, all right. So what we want to do is we want to do some lofting. And we'll see a couple more spline modeling things here later on. But that's what we want to do here. So in this case, it's going to be easier to draw these curves in non-perspective view, right? So if I tap spacebar, right? Remember, tapping spacebar minimizes your perspective view, and it shows you your other four views. These are actually your, these other views are what are called your orthographic views, right? Orthographic means without perspective, uh, and you'll see that um, F and A, right? A is fit all, F is fit selection, right? So if I select an object and I hit F, right? But you'll see that that stuff works in these viewports independently. So I was just hitting A to fit all of those. You'll also notice that four for wireframe, right? When I put my cursor over the viewport, does that, right? So whatever um, whatever viewport your cursor's over, five will turn it to shaded, four will turn it to wireframe. Remember those buttons are right there though. And even things like A and F, A for fit all, F for fit selection work independently in these viewports, right? So there we go. Now in this case, I want to probably start with um, the curve to get the little kind of ruffles on the bottom here, right? So I'm going to draw this from, say, the top view. Now remember, if you want to, you can put your cursor also over the top view and tap spacebar, and that maximizes that viewport. Now if you ever needed to change these or reset these, um, if you go to um, view one, you can always do default view, and that'll usually fix if your viewport gets really weird. Um, go to view default view. Uh, but also, if you go to panels, you'll notice that there, there are perspective views. You can always create a new one. Sometimes I found even default view acts weird. So if you need a new perspective view, you can do that. But also, see, there's the section called orthographic, right? Remember, that means without perspective. So you can do front, top, side, but you can also go to new and you can do back. You can do left, right, top, bottom, right? So remember, the panels uh, thing here gives you some extra controls for that stuff. You can even put, like, say, uh, your outliner in one of these views or your UV editor, right? So what I want to do is I want to draw a curve. How do I do that? Well, we go to the Create menu, right? Anything that you're starting from scratch is in the Create menu. Everything else in the Mesh, Edit Mesh, Mesh Tools, Modeling Toolkit, you're modifying an object that already exists, right? Um, but when you need to start something from scratch, you go to the Create menu here. And it's either primitives, right, uh, or curves. Uh, there are NURBS primitives, uh, and we'll talk about that uh, a little bit more specifically when we do our LAMP. Right? I kind of usually save that discussion really more for there, um, even though technically we're doing curve stuff. Um, so I'll kind of touch upon it here a little bit, but I usually save it a little more for like when we're talking about the bi-rail for exercise two, or actually that's exercise one, yeah. Um, so we'll, we'll talk a little more about nervous primitives later on, um, but really we're gonna do spline stuff that's gonna output as polygons anyways. So we go to create curve tools, right? And there are a couple of options here for these other curves. Um, we'll talk about those a little more when we get to the other ones, but. Um, for right now, we'll just use the CV Curve tool, right? So we'll go to Create Curve Tools, CV Curve Tool, and I'm just going to hit that. And like I said, we'll just, because I want to just get you guys doing a lot, doing your first blind thing. Like I said, later exercises, our, our lamp, we'll do these a little more, we'll go a little more in depth on those differences. So in this case, what we do is we just left click to create a point. Now, by default, um, your uh, curves um, are. 3 degree cubic. That means you have to create at least four points for it to draw the curve properly. So that's why when I left click again to create another point, left click again to create another point, we don't really see a curve yet, just some lines. Now when I click that fourth point, you'll now see a curve shows up. That's because by default this is a 3 degree cubic curve. And that really means it's got a start point and an end point and at least two other control vertices. That's what CD curve means, control vertex. And these are really kind of a term that only relates to uh, NURBS curves and NURBS surfaces. Um, but it's a three degree cubic, so you have to have at least um, four points, a start point, an end point, and at least two other points to allow you to control curvature. 
And what I can do is I can keep left clicking and you see how I can kind of put in a nice bit of little kind of ruffle curve shape. So we just left click, left click, left click. And this will allow us to kind of put those points in. Now when you're done, you hit enter, right? Enter on your keyboard. And then you see it becomes green because it's now an object. Now if I wanted to, and I put my cursor over the curve, I can hold down right mouse button, you'll see it has its own marking menu that's relative to this curve. And you see control vertex or CV. So whenever you see CV in Maya, that means control vertex, right? And you can go back in and you could modify these points, right? Cool. So that gives us a curve. Uh, now in this case, I'm gonna tap spacebar to go out to four views. And you'll see it's kind of pretty high up there, right? And I want the ruffle to be more at the bottom and then thin out at the top. So this is really gonna be our bottom curve. So I'm just gonna you know, grab the green arrow and move this down a bit. Now you might notice also that our pivot's kind of way off here on the center. Um, that's because that's usually what your curve tool does by default is it puts the center of your object at the center of the world. You can always go to the modify center pivot. All right, right there, center pivot. And that just recenters it on the object, right? So there we go. Now in this case, I wanna draw a thinner curve, right? So what I can do is I can go draw another curve in here. So I'm gonna go to create curve tools, CV curve tool. And this one doesn't have to be quite as many points, although it doesn't hurt to have several points. Um, sometimes I'm gonna make this a lot cleaner. So I'll just kind of left click, left click. Uh, probably should have a little bit of irregularity to it, but not a lot, right? We want it to be much more kind of straight. So we're just left click, left click, and it creates a point where we left click and you hit enter and then you go make it. So we're to create a curve, just create CV curve tool, CV curve tool, left click, left click, left click, left click, hit enter, makes it. Now this is an object, so I can delete it, right? And you notice this curve is higher up. Now I want this to be a little closer to the bed, right? and probably even a little higher. There we go. Now, usually to kind of make these curves a little more rounded, we probably should have a couple more copies of this curve. So remember, we can always, uh, and I probably want my center centered, so modify center pivot. And remember, we have the edit duplicate, don't we? We've seen this actually a couple times already on these first two models, right? So edit duplicate allows you to copy a whole object. Remember, edit mesh duplicate allows you to just copy specific polygons. We use that to make the drawer for our end table or our nightstand, right? Um, we're gonna use it on a desk, right? A desk is just gonna be the, uh, an honestly more complicated end, uh, end table, right? It's actually mostly the same concepts. So I'll show you a little more about precision snapping with the snap vertex tool on that one. And we'll talk a little more about stars, but it's gonna be mostly what we did on the end table. So in this case, edit mesh duplicate is just for duplicating polygons. Some of the polygons are often already existing uh, polygon mesh. Edit duplicate is for duplicating a whole object and it can duplicate any object, even curves. So I'm gonna duplicate and I'm gonna bring this one down a little bit just because it helps us to have a little bit more um, to kind of round the curve up properly, right? If you have too few, the curve can behave itself a little bit weirdly. Um, and I'll select this guy again and we'll duplicate that one, edit duplicate. And we'll kind of move this one up maybe in a little bit. And then we'll duplicate again and I'll probably leave one right about there. And then we'll duplicate one more time. Just if you have a few more curves, it makes the loft behave a little more predictably. Now here, this is not quite flat. That's okay. When we mirror this bed over, this will, you know, it'll merge together pretty well. But that gives us our curves. Now you notice that you can copy curves, right? Uh, but you can also make your own. Now in this case, what we want to do, since I've already got them all placed, is I can uh, put my cursor back over perspective tap spacebar, right? Remember, tapping spacebar will minimize a viewport if it's maximized. And then whatever viewport your cursor's over, when you tap spacebar, it'll maximize that. So spacebar is kind of that minimize, maximize. All right. So now what I want to do is I said like I want to loft. Control S to save again. Now, the way lofting works is it does matter the order you select it, right? So if I select this curve and then I select this curve, what it's going to do is it's going to loft from this one to this one. Right? So it's going to create geometry from here to here diagonally. That's not really what we want. So generally you want to kind of select the curves in the order you want them to loft. And it makes a lot more sense that we'd want this guy to loft to this one, right? So create geometry from here to here. And then we can shift, right? Remember shift adds to selections. So I can shift left click. Remember we're also in object mode, right? So remember we're in object mode. So if let's get there, because then this will connect to this one, and then this one will connect to this one, and then we shift left click. So you kind of select in the order you want them to connect. 
There we go. And now what we do is we go to the surfaces menu, right? So this is still in the modeling section because this is all modeling tools. And there is a section called surfaces. And we are really not going to go into this that much. Um, nobody really does serious nerves modeling anymore, right? at least in our industry, right? Um, so when we, even when we use splines, we usually output polygons or convert to polygons pretty quickly. Um, so uh, in particular, we're going to use, use things like loft, revolve, biral, extrude this term. Uh, so we're going to go to loft, right? It's the very top one, right? So we're going to go to loft. And what it's going to do is really it's just built to take separate curves and create geometry in between them based on the order they were selected in. So we're going to go to the loft, but we're going to go to the options box for loft, right? So surfaces loft, we're going to go to the options box. And it brings up these options. Now, most of these defaults are fine. Uniform, auto reverse, cubic, section spans one. The big thing though we want to do is just hit the very bottom. We have output geometry. So by default, it can output as a NURB surface. And like I said, we'll talk about that a little bit more on later videos, um, but we want it to be polygons. So if somebody tells you that spline modeling is NURBS modeling, that is not true. Uh, splines are just curves and you can generate whatever surface type you want from them, right? Uh, we're gonna output polygons. So we click on output geometry polygons and you notice it brings up options down here. So we scroll down. Now, we know that triangles are a reliable polygon in terms of that they're always planar, they'll form nice and predictably. They're not easy to model with though. So we want quads, right? We want quads. Now, standard fit has all this stuff right here. The biggest problem I have with standard fit is it will create a bunch of n-gons and triangles. So for me, anything but standard fit for the tessellate methods is better. Control points doesn't really give you any options, right? Um, but it will basically just build it based off of where the major points were, uh, but it'll still make quads. Count kind of gives you some generic count of how many polygons or roughly, right? But it'll still make all quads. Uh, I prefer uh, my favorite method is the test slate general method because it gives you control over the U and V type direction. That means you can tell it how many edge loops you want this direction and how many edge loops you want this direction. So I prefer general a lot because um, I really feel like it gives me most controls so and it'll still make all quads. Uh, now in this case, um, per surf is gonna do this for the whole entire surface. Uh, and because I have a little bit of nuance in this lower curve, I feel like per surface is not gonna be the best option. Uh, in fact, unless you really need something clean and uniform, per surface I, I find um, is a little too generic. So what you'll do is you'll pick, so that's a little pull down, you'll click on it, and what you'll do is you'll pick the very bottom one, per span, right? And you do it for the V-type also, per span. So you just left click on it, it's a little pull down menu, and you pick per span. The nice thing is there's only one per span option, right? Um, and what that does is it's gonna create three edge loops for each vertex, basically. Now, since there's different vertices on, different vertice counts on these, it'll kind of come up with an average, but it's a pretty good guide. Basically, per span does a better job of being adaptive where you have more detail, right? So if you have a curve that's got more detail, more irregularity, this does a good job of being adaptive about that. Uh, whereas per surface kind of uh, it's going to just put in whatever numbers here for the whole entire surface. So you have to have higher numbers. In this case, I think three is a little overkill, so we'll set those to two, right? We want both the U and V type set to per span. So remember, this is just the loft, right? Surface is loft, and it's the options box. Um, we left everything alone up here, but we did change the output geometry to polygons. And we scroll down to make sure it's quads, and also pick the general tessellate method. And once we did that, we had the U and V type with the numbers. And I switched, I clicked on these pull downs and I switched from per surface, which is the default, per surface, per surface, um, to per span. And per surface, like we said, kind of will do whatever number is in the U and V for the whole object that we're gonna create here. Per span does this number um, in between the vertices that are there, right? So um, if you're gonna use per surface, higher numbers in the U and V. If you're gonna use per span, lower numbers. And I'll hit loft and there we go. Now you'll notice this is far from perfect because of some of the curve issues, right? But here's the thing, those curves are still there, right? So if I want to, if I hit four for wireframe, I can actually go in here and I can still find wherever those curves are at, right there, right? So there's one of those curves. So somebody just left click drag and you see it's got a white and green. You can hold down control to deselect the green, like a five. What I could do is if I want to, I can kind of move this around, right? So sometimes it's just a little too close. You might move it down and out a little bit. Uh, I can grab this bottom curve 
And this is kind of our first introduction to what we call history uh, inside of Maya, right? And what history does, I can even grab this curve, right? Move it down a little bit, maybe out. What history does is it keeps um, connections between the geometry, right? So what that means is that this geometry is the child of those curves, right? So if you go back and modify the curves, it'll modify the geometry underneath it, right? So if I select this curve, I hold down right mouse button, control vertex. I you have to be a little careful with this one, right? Control vertex. Now that guy, you'll notice it'll change the actual underlying geometry. So if you kind of want to maybe play with these ruffles a little bit more, adjust them a little bit better, um, you can start to get that, right? Um, if you need to, and maybe you're finding, hey, maybe I got back to object mode, maybe this curve just wasn't working out for me, right? You can always delete that, and you see how it makes me, maybe it makes it a little simpler for us. I liked having that, but I feel like it gave us a little more direct control. You see how we can kind of move it down to give it a little more control there. So remember, you can go back and select these curves individually, right? And one of the ways you can also do that is if you go to Windows, right? There's a Windows menu here. There's something called Outliner, right? Windows Outliner. What that does, is that brings up a list of everything that's in your scene. And here's all your curves and your objects. Now you see there's a bunch of these grouping. We're gonna talk about that momentarily because that's something we have to clean up for this project, right? But you can easily select your curves from here as well if you want to, right? So you can always select them in view and then kind of deselect what you don't want, right? Hold down control to click on them. But you can also select them here. But there is history between these, right? That means that this geometry is a child of these curves, right? There's history between them. So whenever you modify the original curves, it will modify this geometry. Now in this case, uh, we can see that it's black, right? What that means is the polygons are just flipped inward, right? They're just flipped inward. You can actually see the proper gray on the other side. How do I flip these? Well, make sure you're in object mode, right? Hold down right mouse button, object mode, click on the bed object. And then the mesh display, right? We saw the soften edge on uh, some of our other parts on uh, uh, our head, but you see there's something called reverse in the mesh display, kind of up towards the top. And what that'll do is that'll flip the polygons or their normal directions to point back outward instead of inward. And you see how we kind of have a nice clean form up here because we use several curves, but then we have that nice little ruffle at the bottom here. And you see it's all quads, which is nice and neat, yay. Um, and you saw that we could actually come back in here and just modify these curves and their position affects that, right? So this is our first foray into Maya's history. And I'm gonna talk about more momentarily as well. Uh, now in this case, I'm going to um, not mirror this quite yet because um, I do want to talk about um, how to create the pillows really quick. Uh, and then I'm going to show you guys how to clean up the outliner stuff here. Now the pillows, when you look at pillows, they're really just kind of soft, fluffy, rounded cubes, right? So that's pretty easy for us to create, right? We can go to Create, Polygon Primitives, Cube. There we go. And I've got W off move already, so I'm going to bring it up. And I'm going to hit R for scale to scale it down, right? Because we want it to be a more of a rectangle shape. There we go. Now, at this point, if we really, really wanted to, we could just add some edge loops, do a little bit of shaping, right? Uh, that'll be pretty easy for us. Um, in fact, that's probably a good idea to keep doing that here, right? Um, I'm gonna show you some smooth preview later on, but I feel like we've already got enough on our plates. So we can just go to multi-cut, and we can hold down Control, and if I want, I can hold down Control Shift, put an edge right in the center. But I really do need some extra edge loops here as well. And if we want, we could hold down Control Shift just to put these in the center also, just to give us a little bit of shape. If I want, we can always go to Symmetry here, right? World X, and you notice how it's on, and I can actually put an edge loop here. So hold down Control, kind of put one in a little bit at the corner there. And what we could do with enough edge loops here is we could start to just go back into Q for our regular selection tool, and I could double click on an edge loop, right? Hit W for Move move these in, right? Remember, you can start to take advantage of these squares to move two axes at a time. And I could double click on this one down here, kind of bring this in a little bit, double left click on that one. And you see how this edge loop stops at that three star, right? There's a vertex of three edges coming out. That's a three star, right? Um, so the more you have n-gons and triangles in a mesh, the more you'll run into areas where there isn't a proper kind of um, four star, right? A vertex with four edges coming out of it. 
and your selected edge loops will stop working in those areas. Once again, that's one of the many reasons why we prefer quads for modeling, right? Adding edge loops works really predictably with it, but even selecting edge loops. So I can just double click on these edge loops, double left click. I've got the move tool on, right? You don't have to turn the move tool off to do this, right? And leave it on. And remember, you can move just along this axis and this one too, but if you have these squares, you might as well take advantage of them, right? And I could double click on this one, maybe hit R for scale to scale it out, right? Although in this case, you hit W for move and move it out, and you notice how it won't pull that center one off because of symmetry, right? And I can even grab just this edge and bring that one back in, right? So it's pretty easy to kind of use your symmetry and not have it move off the center. It's one of the cool things about symmetry is that center will not move off no matter what you do. If I want to, I can just select these two edges, maybe bring them down a little bit, just to kind of give that a little bit kind of that frill it gets there. These edges might come out a little bit. And you see just with a few edge loops, you can start to give kind of a little bit more of that kind of rounded shape you're looking for. Kind of create a pillow. And if you want, you could add a few more edge loops in, right? So I could always kind of go in here and maybe put a multi-cut in there and in there. Double click on that one. Maybe hit R for scale to scale this all out a little bit, just to get a little bit more roundness, right? So you can always go back in here and just kind of add a few more multi-cuts. Right, just to kind of give you a little bit more direct control over shape. Maybe scale this one up a little bit. Double click on that one, scale it up a little bit. W for move, you can always move them out a little bit here. And you see you can kind of really get a little bit more roundness on this stuff. Maybe even double click on that one to bring it back in. And this will start to allow you to get a little bit more of kind of the shape you're looking for for this, right? Uh, for these pillows, I'd probably try to keep them quads. Um, you know, if you need to, you can always add in an extra loop or two to do a little bit better shaping. But in this case, you see the symmetry worked well for giving us some good control of shape for it, All right? So we just created the cube, made sure to put an edge loop down the center, turned our symmetry on, and then this was just multi-cut, and I was putting edge loops in, right? Multi-cut, hold down control, put edge loops in. And then I was just selecting edges or partial edge loops, and I was just moving and scaling. And this gives us a decent pillow. Um, you can always try to get that shape even closer, right? Um, I'm just trying to show you enough that you can kind of get it working. So I'm gonna turn symmetry off. Uh, remember, it's kind of got some of those hard edges on it, so you can always uh, hold that right mouse button for object mode. And you can always go back to mesh display, soften the edge, because that'll kind of soften. Um, it'll give that smoothing of 180 degrees automatically on everything, so that kind of all the polygons shade collectively. I can hit W to move it down, kind of over here. Move it up, R for scale, maybe a little bit of rotate, right? And if we want, we could always use mesh mirror, right? Mesh mirror options box. In this case, I wanna do it on the X. So you see we're doing kind of a lot of great little repeats. And then of course you can make different pillows or even duplicate these and do a little bit of different shaping to them. But really a pillow is just like the mattress, it's a cube and you put some edge loops on it, and when you have enough edge loops, you can start to shape the thing around it. Now, in later projects, I'll show you how you can use Smooth Preview to make this process even easier, but for right now, it's still kind of better for you guys to be using multi-cut and getting used to shaping. So even though later on, you'll see that and go, oh, I didn't see that. Well, it's good for you guys to get some practice with multi-cut and regular shaping to see that you can do it that way. Um, all right, so those are some pillows. Um, but you saw those pillows actually weren't anything new, right? We've used multi-cut before. We've moved, rotated, scaled before uh, to shape. We've mirrored before. So you can see that this first project really is just kind of, even though there's some new stuff in, in all these areas, there's also just a lot of like, hey, we're extruding, we're multi-cutting, and we're gonna be using those a lot the whole term, right? Um, and just selecting different selection types, you know, kind of, um, you know, vertex edge face mode, object level, move, rotate, scale, right? All right, so there's our pillows. Now. Before I mirror this over, I want to talk to you guys about history and cleaning up your outliner. Because this is actually part of your grade for your project, uh, for every project. Um, you want a clean outliner. This is not a clean outliner, right? This is actually kind of one of the drawbacks to Maya. Um, it does history for all the objects. So in this case, I'm going to maybe uh, click on, um, say, this one right here for the moment. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to go to the channel box layer editor, right? So modeling toolkit kind of has our main modeling tools. We've seen attribute editor for like image plane stuff, but there's also the channel box layer editor right here, right? It's kind of right up here at the top. 
Uh, remember, these buttons right here also do these as well. But there are these little tabs on the side here. And one of the things you'll notice when I select this object is one, it's got some transform values, which um, eventually when you pass it off to somebody else, you don't want to have that there. Also, you'll see, and these are just object level transforms. Also, you'll notice that there's a section called inputs. This is your history in Maya. What is Maya's history? Well, it's basically everything you've done to the object, right? When it came to the spline model with the loft, right? You click on the loft to see that there's the flip, there's the NURBS test slate, and there's the loft controls, right? Uh, and it, this history still makes it connected to those curves. But you'll see when we go to the other objects, you can see there's the mirrors, there's the soften edges to kind of make the uh, shading look more smooth on the knobs. There's the merge vertices. Remember all the shaping we did, the tweaks, all the extrusions of edges, right? Um, if we go down here further, you can see that there's the bevel and the circular eyes. And you'll see the history, this input section is your history in Maya. That is everything you've done to this object, the mirrors, the extrusions. Whatever is at the top is the most recent. Whatever is at the bottom, polycube, is the first thing you did. And one of the things you'll notice when you go to history in here is that if I say go to this extrusion, or let's even say circularize here, so I click on circularize, you'll notice it opens up its options. Now, what happens if I go in here and I say, I'm gonna change this radio offset to say three. Uh oh, you notice how it's doing really, really weird, unpredictable stuff to your geometry? History is one of those things that initially seems cool that I can go to any step and modify it, but believe it or not, often it is chaos, right? History is like it is in Back to the Future or Avengers Endgame, right? Or any of the time travel movies I talked about. You change stuff and it has the butterfly effect where it can have radically different outcomes in the future if you go back and change it. Same thing here. So this is Maya's way of giving you procedural modeling where you can always go back and adjust these procedures. And sometimes it is cool and useful. Basically, the more recent something is, the more likely, particularly if it's on non-overlapping sections, right? Like if I was doing a bunch of extrusions or multi-cuts up here, but not down here, right? Um, you're, it might not negatively affect that stuff down there, right? But that's often not the case. In fact, a lot of the times that's not the case. So history modeling is something you don't need a lot of the time, right? Just some of the time. Um, and you can already see here, you adjust stuff and it can have a pretty chaotic result, right? So I go to this extrude and we could say, hey, let's add extra divisions. And it just is usually pretty destructive, right? Um, my rule is if it's kind of more at the top and it's on totally different sections of the models, you're probably safe to change it. The further down it goes and the more that the, you're doing stuff on the same polygons again and again, the more likely you're gonna get chaos and your model will do horrible, weird things, right? So history is not actually that useful for most modeling. Um, sometimes it is for certain kinds of stuff, um, but that's Maya's history. So what we have to do is we have to get rid of this, right? Because we also don't want this hanging around. We don't need it around. It can actually cause um, slowdown in software. And it also can um, even cause uh, Maya to uh, take longer to load stuff in. And you don't want to send over something that's terribly organized with lots of history and a bunch of extra objects you don't need to your other teammates. So this is the last part of our modeling of the bed and you'll want to do it for your end table as well. Um, so I'll kind of do a quick third video just for the end table, it'll take a couple minutes. But what we want to do is, with these guys selected, what we can do is we can go to edit, delete by type history, edit, delete by type history. And what that does is you'll see that um, one, I might start to get rid of these groups that were created by Maya. Now, these groups occur because of certain modeling functions, which in our case really is only the combining, right? Combine, separate, booleans, which we haven't talked about, and edit, uh, edit mesh, duplicate, and extract, right? Those will create groups. Uh, it's actually a little bit annoying in Maya, right? Uh, most modeling functions won't though, but certain things, basically if you're taking one object, making it to multiple, or taking multiple objects, making it one, it'll create grouping. So one of the things I do is you can delete history, and you see that one, it broke all the connection, got rid of those. But also we don't really want these transforms this way, right? Because at this point, if somebody wanted to scale these um, to be twice the size, right? They'd have to figure out, okay, well, what's, you know, twice 0.933. Um, not that hard, but it's a little bit of extra work. So one of the things besides edit, 
delete by type history, and there's a quickie for that. That shows how important it is to delete history in Maya. Right? If you're finding you need to slow down or you just don't want a complex outliner, just delete history on a pretty regular basis, right? Um, but that's just edit, delete by type history. But there's also the modify menu. And we're gonna do this on all of our models and all of our projects. So you're gonna see this plenty more times. But you know, we just had to do it first time. So modify, freeze transformation. Did you see that? What that, that does is that zeroes it out. So now if I want to make this twice the size, I just type in two for the scale. Just easier, right? So generally what you end up doing is kind of, you know, um, freezing transforms in your objects, deleting history. Now the cool thing is you can actually do this for everything. So I can select every object. I can just, you know, hold down right mouse button in object mode, left click drag to select everything. And what we can do is we can go to edit, delete by type history. Now the nice thing is you'll see that that actually got rid of just about every group, right? If for whatever reason it didn't, you can always select that group in outliner and go to edit, ungroup. Now you might have groups inside of groups. So if you ungroup and you see more groups, follow the same process, select that group and edit ungroup, right? <laughs> uh, but oftentimes if you select everything and uh, delete history, it'll get rid of all the groups. Sometimes it won't, but a lot of the time it will. That also means that these curves are no longer connected to the original loft. So we can just select those and delete them, right? Remember, this is just Windows Outliner, right? Brings this up. So if I left click on a curve and then I shift left click on a curve down here, it selects all the ones in between. We just hit delete. I'm also gonna select everything again because it's always a good idea to um, delete history first so there's no groups, right? And then do your modify freeze transformations. Because if you freeze transformations on a group, it'll freeze transformations to the group, but not the object, right? And that can cause problems later on. So generally, I will make sure that there's no groups left um, unless I wanted that group to be there, um, which in that case, I would have just created a group, right? Um, and then I freeze transforms. So I, so I kind of usually save that for later. But now you'll see these are all kind of zeroed out. There's no more history. The last thing is these should probably be labeled, right? So we double click on this one in the outliner. And you see when we double click on it, we can change the name. So these are rails, there we go. And we can see that that's the mattress. So double click on that, call that mattress, there we go. Um, we'll do this one for the pillows, double click, pillows, there we go. And that's the bed post. So remember, uh, Windows Outliner brings this up, double click. And we can say um, posts. Now this, you don't have to follow an exact naming convention, just be reasonably descriptive, right? Now this one, I don't really, I'm not quite done with yet because I want to mirror it over, right? So remember, right mouse button, object mode. And we can go mesh, mirror options box, X axis, combine with original. By default, it's going to have a merge on. So we'll mirror it and it should merge those ones down the center pretty nicely for you. If for whatever reason you see it's doing weird merges and it merges triangles down here, you can always actually turn off um, uh, the, the automatic um, or adjust the merge threshold right here, right? So the mirror options come up and you could turn that merge threshold to be lower. So if I set it to like zero, see how it won't merge. But if I set it up to say like five, it'll start to merge a lot of stuff, right? So it merges all that stuff. So usually a pretty low merge threshold, like in this case, 0.2 should work perfect for us. We can Q to turn that off. And there we have our blanket. Now in this case, you'll notice how um, it didn't create um, history for that. Um, go back to channel box editor. There's no, there is history here though. So we'll just do a quick edit to the bed history. Just make sure it's not there. Transform's already frozen, but we can always go modify, freeze transformations. There we go. And then we can just double click on this one. Call it uh, blanket. There we go. And that is the bed.